Thank you, thank you, Emily, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming to uh, presentation today. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, answering complex questions, question answering system. I'll define what complex questions is, and I'll explain why why I include in the while. So let's get started. So in the past few years, um, the question answering community has made a lot of progress in making systems questions given context. So you can see that our systems nowadays can um, answer this given question when it's movie upcoming and released given the fixed context that talks about the movie. That's all good. But these systems usually fail to answer uh, slightly more complex questions like the following. What is the Aquaman actor's next movie? I actually plug this um, question into a squad, a model train on squad and but it's part of the answer. Um, to, to show you why this is, uh, we need to first understand why this question is difficult to answer. So I'll try to show you that uh, this question actually requires multiple hops of reasoning, um, multiple steps of reasoning among different entities and different attributes uh, for you to actually arrive at the answer. So for example, there are multiple movies in the world um, that might relate to certain actors. All of them are actually related to this actor. That's not mentioned anywhere in the in the uh, question that we're trying to answer, and these movies have their own release dates. In order to answer this question, you actually have to reason about all of these different entities and properties to find the correct answer. 
Um, that's what I mean by multiple uh, steps of reasoning. And this is really tough for our current question answering systems trained on squat because they kind of more or less rely on local pattern match to you know, find the context that has something that uh, looks close to an answer and emits that answer. So I argue that for our question answering system to be really useful in the future um, to help us obtain knowledge from a large text corpus, we need to enable them to perform multi-step reasoning. And in order for these systems to be applicable to large text corpora, we need them to be scalable. And on top of that, I would also add that we need these systems to be explainable in the sense that all of the decisions or um, all of the computation um, steps in the model should be exposed to a human as much as possible in a way that humans can understand um, so that we can look into what the model is doing and um, intervene if necessary. So today I'm going to talk about uh, some of our recent work on enabling multi-top reasoning and question answering. And specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, first a data set called Hapa QA that was uh, published in NLP last year and more recent work that we're uh, presenting at NLP this year that um, works on that data set. So let's uh, jump to the data set first. Before, um, before I go further, I would like to address two of the questions I get asked quite a bit. Why do you want to work on multi-top question? So I would like to sort of uh, approach this question from two angles. Um, one of them is a lot of people ask me, you know, how many questions are actually multi-top? Are these things actually natural or do people actually come up with these questions? Um, and my answer to that is, um, part of the reason that we're not seeing a lot of multi -hop questions being asked today might be a filtering effect. So think about asking a person, how much do you talk to your phone in 1990? Of course they don't talk to their phone because their phones don't do interesting, don't do interesting things like Siri does. But it's very difficult to imagine. Uh, therefore you have this filtering effect of the system not supporting, therefore there's no, uh, there's no actual usage. Another side of this um, answer might be a little bit more surprising to people, um, where sometimes questions that are seemingly simple. So think about this question. How many people does this room hold? In the natural conversation, this might come up, but in order to answer this question, we could first figure out what this room is, where, where it's located, which building it is, which room number it is, or you can then read the specs about that room. So um, I'm arguing that these multi-hop questions are coming up a lot more naturally only that than we realize. Let's go ahead and try to solve it. Unfortunately, uh, one of the uh, one of the reality of two years ago was we didn't really have a good uh, question answering data set that Trains, uh, trains systems, test systems that are able to perform more. Uh, this is Squad, a, an example from Squad, um, which is one of the popular. Most of the question answering this at the time was following this recipe for Squad, where you have a question and one or multiple local contexts where answer can be found and um, the question answering system is presented with a small set of paragraphs to find the answer. So instead, we set out to build this data set that contains uh, 100,000 questions that require at least two weeks of DR. That's more challenging in uh, two ways. One of them is um, you would need to um, reason about workflow supporting that. And another side of this is want to encourage people to build systems that actually find these two weeks of PRM from the end. 
more about that later. This is joint work with my collaborators, Julian and Kai Jung. But you also have the answers stored. Exactly, exactly. I will uh, talk about the details. That's a great question. So uh, we define hop as one step or one relation application. So um, here uh, you can see this question is two because you have one, one relation from the name of the novel to author and another from the author. Uh, right, but we're not, uh, we're, we're trying to stay away from defining this. So, aside from multi hub reasoning, uh, this data set features uh, three cool things uh, that we think are still relevant today. One of them is uh, it's purely text based. So, we're, not, we're trying to stay away from defining any uh, schema or making use of basis. Ex they encourage explainability in question answering systems. It's later. And finally, it also features this new kind of comparison questions that um, really opens up for all multiple steps of reason. So what do I mean by each of these three things? Let's start with um, text-based. So a very natural way to, to think about building a, a question answering data set involving multiple steps of reasoning is you can probably start with knowledge bases because knowledge bases have well-defined entities and well-defined relations. And if you already have a knowledge base built, you can probably just take a relation chain data in your knowledge base and ask a question about the entities at the end. But instead, we take the approach of a crowdsourcing where we show crowd workers or Amazon mechanical trackers to Wikipedia articles. And we ask them to come up with Reformed text based uh, questions. So, this maximally sort of uh, frees us from any kind of pre existing schema. Although we're not claiming that triggers are always very creative, we do find a ton of very interesting. So, next is explainability. Um, I didn't really mention this uh, a lot in my uh, motivation motivating slide, but a lot of the existing question answering data sets uh, usually provide you with the, the context, the paragraphs you want to answer the question from, the question, and the answer itself. But that in itself, we already assume that question answering system explain itself. So in our crowdsourcing um, procedure, we also ask participants to please highlight the sentences in these two paragraphs, these two Wikipedia articles that they use to arrive at the answer. The hope is uh, we can provide these, uh, this extra supervision to our question answering systems to, for them to find better answers. And also we ask the systems to predict these as an explanation of their answer. But not least, about a quarter of the questions in Hapa QA are this novel kind of uh, comparison questions um, where they can be arithmetic comparison or they can be comparing properties of two entities. And the answer here could be yes or no, which really um, opens up the possibility for uh, different kinds of questions that people are asking and different kinds of reasoning skills required by, by these questions. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't sort of invest too much into these comparison questions because although they are sort of more diverse in the possible ways of reasoning, there is a downside. So we mix it with how many more things is. Yeah, that's very fair. And that's uh, the drop data set. Yeah. So, 
how do you actually build that? Um, we actually make use of the hyperlink structure in Ruby, where um, we assume that in order for someone to be able to come up with a uh, useful or natural question that involves two HTML articles, they probably need to be related in some way. And here, by related, we mean they are connected by a direct hyperlink in their neutral frame. And we filter these paragraph pairs uh, for some very common patterns that don't really lead to interesting questions. So for example, a lot of um, Wikipedia pages linked to YouTube, not for a reason that they're connected to, to YouTube or have anything uh, substantial to do with YouTube, but only because the, uh, someone has a YouTube channel. So we filter out uh, some of these uh, pairs of um, Wikipedia articles, and we collect, uh, we show Turkers these pairs of uh, articles to come up with questions. And for the comparison questions, we make use of the list of lists in Wikipedia, where uh, these lists usually contain uh, very relevant entities or um, articles that share some common with people that we went to the moon or the highest mountain on Earth. And this uh, ends up uh, being a very diverse data set. So we sampled 100 random examples from the data set to analyze what types of reasoning are uh, required. And we've already mentioned um, the Aquaman actor's neck movie that's a large part of required by this data set. We also have a um, type of question. I'll show you an example of some other types of reasoning required by this. So one of, the, one of them is uh, sort of a, an intersection kind of reasoning where uh, you have to find the answer that satisfies both of the properties mentioned in the question. Uh, we also have some implicit um, relations not uh, always stated in um, implicit relations in the real world that's not explicit, explicitly stated in the text. So in this case, we have a, a control group that's uh, co-located with a station that's not clearly stated in, in the text. And sometimes turkers are a little more creative, more steps of reasoning than we imagined, uh, so I'm not going to. Uh, this is a relatively smaller portion of the data set. So to actually evaluate our systems, uh, we sort of uh, come up with, came up with two different settings. One of them is a distractor setting, which is more geared towards testing the system's ab ability to perform multi-stock, uh, multi multi-hop reasoning within a small closed context. So we just take the two gold paragraphs that we use to collect the data. We use information retrieval to gather eight other paragraphs and bundle these 10 paragraphs to send to the question answering system <clears throat> to train and evaluate. Uh, this has the advantage of not requiring a lot of computational load. And for the full wiki setting, we just hand the systems the question and ask them to find the answer that. And for evaluation metrics, we, uh, we mentioned that we want system to be explainable. So we not only evaluate their uh, accuracy on the answers, but we also evaluate how accurate their um, generating the supporting facts. So we use the standard exact match and F1 metrics. <clears throat> and in order to unify them into a single metric, uh, we multiply the precision and recall for these two aspects and calculate uh, a new set of EM and F1 scores. And the intuition here is that if the system is bad either on generating accurate answers or generating uh, accurate explanations for its answers, or should be penalized. And for this paper, we used um, a baseline model that's adapted from Vida++, uh, which was a pretty standard model. Um, and we made some customization to make use of the supporting facts in our data set and also predict yes and no answers. 
the next band is. So the performance. Uh, the performance of baseline model is not that bad, but uh, also it's very far from perfect. As you can see in the distractor setting, um, the joint F1, uh, which is combining the answer and the supporting tags, is only 40%. And if you move to the full wiki setting where we give 10 paragraphs from Wikipedia, um, that performance is less than 20%. Because now the problem is a lot more challenging. That's a great question. Uh, so the, the answer is a little bit uh, nuanced in the sense that um, there are different numbers of candidates for the answer. So they're not directly comparable in that. Yeah. There are more than, a lot more than one. more stance than there are samples. So it's not a difference. Uh, there are more possible spans with the answers than there are parentheses. That could be so there are more possible parentheses. Because supporting five star sentence. Oh I see. It's okay, a binary label. Sense. Moving on, uh, we also sampled some uh, random examples uh, to estimate human performance by collecting at least three other um, annotations. And we're focusing on joint F1 from here on uh, in the talk. So you can see that humans are actually very consistent. Right? We can achieve about 80% F1 um, with additional annotation, which means um, they not only agree a lot on the answers, but also they agree a lot on supporting facts. Compare that to our baseline model in the distractor setting, you can see there's a huge drop for the model not being sort of fine. Even if you um, add all of the, uh, remove all of the distractors from the team, just train the model on the four paragraphs, the model is still sort of lagging a lot behind the human performance, which at the time suggested to us that uh, we need to develop better models. So with that, I want to move on to our system that actually works on this data set. What are the options for the search? That's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, in the collection of the data set, we tried everything we could do to review um, top tankers um, samples from the data set, provided feedback. So it's, we made sure to review all the And, and we also in the annotation uh, in the annotation interface, uh, we try to provide feedback to tier three. Uh, that's a great question. Um, we didn't do that because that would just double the cost of collection and not necessarily we won't necessarily end up with A, as many questions, and B, um, like even like good, reasonable amount of good questions. Yeah, 
there's definitely a certain percentage of the questions that are um, easier in some sense um, or more uh, gameable. I think uh, look into the ranking set. Ten paragraphs, and sometimes the answer is one of these paragraphs that doesn't look. So that's why we're moving forward to this work on full wiki set, which I think is more applicable and more applicable <laughs> to the real world and more challenging. Because in the real world, you're never just. So without any further questions, I'll move on to talking about our more recent work on how to actually build a system that works on this. Uh, before before talking about our system, I want to briefly review what people have done before our system, what people have done up to until this point. And <clears throat> uh, this is a very uh, sort of standard diagram, uh, standard paradigm of how these systems follow for open domain question answering. I, and by open domain question answering, I mean um, both open domain in that the domain of the questions are and also open context where you have to really deal with millions, millions of documents to find the answer. So uh, following uh, the work by Dan Chi Chen, a lot of people have taken this retrieve and then read approach for their open domain question answering systems where they use the question as a search query to find uh, Wikipedia or vet articles to answer the question. And once they have a set of uh, top retrieved articles, they basically just concatenate those articles and send that into a question answering for, for that answer. Um, that's all good when your uh, question can actually retrieve all of the supporting facts. Or I would argue here that they're fundamentally bad or not suitable, suitable for um, multi-hop questions or questions require, that require multiple um, steps of reasoning, because usually there's something hidden in the question that you need to answer first uh, before you can move on to find more support. Uh, so other people have tried to attack this on a more end-to-end -end approach. Uh, so basically people have tried to train in a large neural retrieval model and try to you know end-to-end -end use policy gradient uh, to optimize the uh, query that they're generating and iterate between retrieve and read in this tanked neural model. But I would argue that's not very efficient. And also, a lot of these neural systems kind of require uh, distance supervision to bootstrap the uh, retrieval model to be biased towards the, the paragraphs that might contain it, which is a technique that might also fall apart multi-hop question. So in a brief summary, uh, I'm going to argue that Dr. QA or those kind of retrieve and read models, they're efficient because they make use of off-the-shelf uh, IR systems for that, uh, instead of giant neural models, uh, but they're not inherently multi-hop capable. And uh, they are explainable in the sense that the search queries they use um, can be read by humans. The search queries are the question. And end-to-end -end or fully neural systems are kind of the opposite. And we want to build a system that achieves these three things. So I would argue now that um, in order to be efficient and explainable, we probably want to mimic what people have done for uh, Docker QA or the, this kind of approach to fall back to using text-based IR, text-based information retrieval, and actually generate natural interface so that people can actually read this, the queries that systems are generating. Um, so basically following the reasoning set. And to achieve multi-hop reasoning, uh, I would argue that we should move away from just retrieving the question and reading the top results and really move into a regime where we can have multiple steps of retrieval based on what we have. And this is our system. This is joint work with uh, Vera Lin, Leo Mara, and Zia Wang, my, my advisor, Chris.
So uh, remember my um, first example, of the Aquaman actress next lady example. Uh, for to answer that question, we actually need to find information about Jason Momoa actor from Aquaman, which has with and the question has zero overlap with ever Jason Momoa other movies. So if you just resort to retrieving with the question itself, it's very difficult to find all of the supporting and you wouldn't be able to. And we're arguing that by reading and retrieving iteratively, uh, you can achieve that same goal uh, a lot more efficiently. Exactly. So we actually have this estimate in the original Hapa QA paper uh, that if you use our IR system in the in that paper, you would need to retrieve on average of 600 documents uh, before you can find both of the goals. Does that answer that question? Um, not explicitly. So in the Hapa Q&A set, we provide uh, you with the book, both of the paragraphs used for answering question and the supporting facts, questions, and answers. Um, we retain all the hy hyperlinks. You can use them. But in this work, we don't. Right, no. I, we, we can go back to that point. I would argue that ideal system, when it sees a question like this, this is an actual example from Hapa uh, QA, which the novel by the author of Armada would be adapted as a feature film by Steven Spielberg. I um, argue that an ideal system would first generate a query to search for something, right? Search for something that's leading us closer to answering the question, but not just using the question itself to search for some of the things that we have made up. So, <clears throat> ideally, this query generator will be able to pick out that the novel by the author of Armada is a useful um, hot spot in the question, and we send out the search. We come up, uh, we search for Wikipedia for a small set of paragraphs, Wikipedia articles, and then we can move on uh, with this set of paragraphs and, and read it. This is the critical part that we differ from uh, previous work. So <clears throat> instead of just relying on our one retrieval step, uh, we're going to argue that the second retrieval step, the step is also. So hopefully we, we can train a model that takes in the question and this first set of paragraphs that we already retrieved and come up with another search query. In this case, Ernest Klein, which is uh, who is the uh, author of Armada. And then we can launch a second more directed query or more pointed query for more supporting facts. Uh, of course, we can do this for multiple steps. In this work, we just limit the number of retrieval steps to two, and we concatenate these uh, paragraphs at the end of retrieval. So that's the entire system. The question is, how do you actually build these? Yeah, that's that's definitely right. Um, we didn't try very hard. Uh, we we basically just retrieved a total of ten paragraphs to be fair with uh, other systems that are that we built. So from both hops, um, we or from either hop we retrieved five documents and we. Getting back to this, how do you actually find these query generators when you actually train them? Because there's no explicit supervision. Yeah, for, for this kind of model. So we um, we go down the intuition that if you want to find multiple 
if we want to find multiple needles in a haystack, the best way is not to find each needle one by one. The best way is if the needles are actually connected by a thread, we want to find that thread. So uh, looking at our example, these threads are actually pretty, uh, pretty obvious. If you already have a question and if you have the two paragraphs, these will be the threads that a human, for example, will probably make use of. So these are like keys that help us open new chain of reasoning. So uh, for simplicity, I'm going to call these the question paragraph one and paragraph two. Tabulates a little bit of uh, what we have. I'm going to argue that um, there's a simple observation that this thread is usually just an intersection between what we already have and what we're trying to look for. So for example, in the first half of um, the first half of answering this question, the first half of the reasoning, uh, all we have is the question and we're trying to look for the paragraph, <coughs> but the first paragraph. In half two, uh, we have the question, we have hopefully retrieved paragraph one along with some other top search results, and we're looking for paragraph two. And you can list this on and on. So for to find the key, uh, I'm going to argue that we can just take the intersection or take the overlap, what we already have at any given step uh, with what we are looking for. And that's going to be the search query, the Oracle query that we use to train our systems because we have access to the question. Minimal set of information, but we are able to pull out from that some more explainable. I get confused about this setting. So for these paragraphs, there you do have some paragraphs in your data, yeah. like 10 paragraphs. Are these overlap with that 10 paragraphs or paragraphs? Or do you do anything? Good question. Um, I, I didn't, sorry, I didn't explain this uh, quite clearly. So in this work, we're focused on the full wiki setting of how to calculate, where the system is basically just given a question at test time mm -hmm. and five million in the computer. And the two articles are in is five million, but you have ten. And but during training, you have yeah. You Dur have that ten. Uh, during training, we we know about the two okay. the paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And then five seven. Yeah, five million. Five, five, five million. So all the questions in this data set uh, has two supporting documents. Basically two documents, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean steps of reason. Sometimes it's a little bit. But you can kind of see that the same, same principle applies over many steps. So, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we didn't pay too much attention to the stopping criteria for this data set, uh, for this work, because uh, but if you want to, yeah, if you want to develop a system that's capable of doing arbitrary steps of retrieval, then definitely you can just optimize. But here we're arguing that as long as you have information about what the gold documents are in your training time, um, you can apply this kind of strategy. Thank you. Thank you.
it seems like what you want, right? You're, you're, what you're trying to do is learn what is the relation that I need to find in this paragraph or set of statements. So, like in training, in training time, you have both documents. One of them is the one that you quote unquote get first. It's, well, you actually know which one it is. Right? I do not. No, no, no. You can figure that out because sure. there's a link that corresponds to the other document. It doesn't, it doesn't. It doesn't necessarily thread. work in one direction. Right. right. The two documents are connected by a thread, right? Yes. So there. So it might go. It might be bidirectional, but it, 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 it could it's also branch from the question. So think about comparison questions. You have who's taller or who's okay, older. Okay, but in forty-five percent of the documents, you have the same. Sure. Right. Um, and so you really just want need to find who you want to find. What is the author? Who is the author of our model? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's you could train that classifier to learn author. Mm -hmm. It does seem like it would be helpful since you already do provide that data. Since you use this data to build the thing in, yeah. in training, to build to provide that bridge back, you kind of already. Um, we're trying to stay away from making assumptions about relations or explicit set of things. Yeah, but you're using the fact that you have. I think that's true, but we're we're not making a lot of uh, we're, we're not making a lot of use of the um in this model. But if I was trying to answer this question, I would first say, okay, who's the author of our model? Yeah. And then once finding that, I would say, okay, right. and so forth. That's not very useful. Um, that's actually surprisingly what this finds. That's what this approach finds. To a search query, and uh, I can show you some. <clears throat> so, I'll explain a little bit what this find overlap function is. Uh, it basically is a, a bunch of heuristics based on uh, longest common subsequence and longest common substring. Uh, we generate over generate a bunch of candidates, and we send each search query through our search engine, Elasticsearch. And we try to find, uh, we read the search results and try to choose the one that uh, yields the highest rank uh, for, for, the, for the one of the paragraphs, uh, one of the documents we're trying to find. By rank star, I mean they're not just the same. Sometimes from the queries. So here are some examples uh, generated by. Um, this heuristic. Uh, on the left, you have the question What government position was held by the woman who portrayed Corliss Archer in the film Kiss and Tell? Um, and if you follow our heuristic in the first step, um, the model actually, or the heuristic actually generates Corliss Archer in the film Kiss and Tell, which is pretty decent. But on the second step, uh, it constructs a new fact or a new attribution. This demonstrates how this would be difficult to achieve a weak models. And how do we actually um, generate these queries during test time? Uh, we propose to cast this problem as question answering. So in question answering, uh, you usually have a question, a context, and you're trying to find an answer that's in the context or that's entailed by the context. So we make use of the ex exact same interface um, where we plug in the question and the context is basically what we have at each step of reasoning. And we try to predict those keys, those Oracle queries that we derived during training time. And that completes our system. We name our system uh, Go Entity Retriever um, because it's most of the time finding uh, entities in Wikipedia. And we argue that it actually achieves all of these three desiderata, which it's efficient and explainable because we're generating natural language queries um, <clears throat> to uh, leverage um, very efficient IR systems. And we're inherently multi-hop because we can um, read the context at any time and determine whether new queries from more information. Um, so, how does the system work, uh, or how well does it work in, in reality? I'm going to show you some results on uh, query, uh, 
on the uh, query evaluation on IR evaluation, and also some end-to-end -end evaluation. So for IR, we care about, uh, in this case, we care about recall. Recall at 10 specifically because uh, we care about recall for these two paragraphs in Hapa 3A because the higher the recall, the higher the chance we can actually answer it. If recall is low, then we are probably missing something. You know, okay. Um, we're comparing two systems. One is single hop, which lets you turn the search engine and then do the question. On the right side here. Uh, you can see that on the first hop, um, these two systems aren't actually all that different. Uh, we probably gain a little bit by filtering out some of the uh, noise in the questions. Um, but on the second hop, we improve recall by, uh, by about 25%, which means we raise the ceiling for the question answering model. is by improving the recall for these parallels, for these systems. And for end-to-end -end evaluation, um, like I mentioned, we're working on the full key setting of Hapa QA, but we res uh, restrict our system to only look at 10 paragraphs in total to be fair to the previous work. We still use FIDAS++ as our question answering, uh, question answering component. And we focus on the joint F1 earlier, which focuses not only on the accuracy of the answers, but also on the accuracy label. So I'm gonna show you some results. On the left, um, in the shaded area are some depth set numbers for ablation. On the right are hidden depth. Um, if we just plug in our system, uh, plug our system into the original Hop QA IR system, our, our question answering component, uh, we get a pretty poor performance. If we replace that with Elasticsearch, we can actually get a pretty big gain just from that. So this kind of tells you that if you want to work with a large collection of documents, making sure that your IR engine works actually matters. Uh, but that actually brings up no I'm not, not much closer to the best published system at the time, uh, which is about 35% on this metric. Uh, empirically, um, so that's a good idea. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so there's a trade-off between <clears throat> uh, whether you want the top, uh, there's a trade-off between having more complete context and uh, having more noise, basically. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> so, yeah, like I was mentioning, um, this actually doesn't explain the difference between the so election search is not enough to make up the difference between the state of the art at the time, the best published paper uh, result at the time, and question answering component. If we just apply um, our iterative retrieval and read um, approach, we can improve on the previous state of the art by 4% um, joint F1. But this, uh, unfortunately, was beaten very soon by a contemporaneous uh, work on this data set. Uh, but I'll, I'll take a look into that later in the next slide. Um, I do want to leave you uh, with, with this bar on the left side, which is if we replaced all of the information retrieval uh, queries, the search queries with our Oracle queries, in, in Golden Retriever, we can actually achieve a better performance on the depth set uh, than the state of the art at the time, which probably suggests that we need to look more into information retrieval, the information gathering side of things. That could be really good. Okay. 
predictive are there to test with each other? So Great question. I have half of the answer to that. So <clears throat> in uh, the Hoppe QA paper, we actually experimented with just feeding the question answering model for the facts by input circle. It's one way, not really. Not really. Not really. Because that's that, future information. You're saying these are the supporting facts. You don't necessarily use those supporting facts. You're saying that's in true. your actual system, you create that's true. Yeah, they're more like the future in there. But I mean, that's that this future improves the future. Yeah. So I'll try to explain this bar um, a little bit. So, so this is the uh, Hava QA full wiki leaderboard, and you can see some of the systems are after published after our work. And um, if you look more closely at all of the top systems on the leaderboard, actually, Almost all of them except us use BERT. We're not using BERT in any part of the system. We use Dr. QA as our car generators. We use BIDAP as our question answering component. So uh, we're expecting a, a performance gain in the future. <clears throat> so I also wanted to show you some uh, examples of generated queries from our system in actual evaluation. So these are examples of death set fish. Um, the question is, what, uh, what video game character did the voice actor, actress in the animated film Alpha and Omega voice? Uh, so our model generated this query, voice actress in the animated film Alpha and Omega. That seems pretty sensible, where the uh, Oracle query, the query derived from the, the rules or heuristics, was actually an animated film Alpha and Omega voice, it's not quite a constituent. Um, and for this example, our second uh, second top query matched exactly um, the Oracle. Uh, and sometimes this model um, generates things that are roughly correct as, uh, as many other question answering models. In this particular case, it's being overly specific in the second half um, of its queries. So, query is how many citizens? No. I know, but. It's a district. The, city. Yeah, the they... question is about the city. Oh, oh. Yeah, it's phrased a little bit awkward. Because you really want to know how many people live in Hong Kong? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> so, I do want to say though that this is a lot more explainable than your. If something goes wrong, you can actually see it and you can actually intervene and issue another search query to continue the processing. So, I think that's that's great. So, I'll talk to you about uh, two of our recent work. One of them is QA <laughs> and the other is Golden Retriever coming this year to NLP near you. Um, and I want to end with some takeaways uh, that I want to share. So I think what Hub QA is a very good problem to uh, be tackling because it allows us to get more in-depth understanding or in-depth usage of our text corpora. Uh, but I hope I've also shown that a multi an open domain multi hop question answering requires something much more than your final question answering. Uh, you need systems that actually work for gathering um, supporting facts from a lot of documents and reason them. And last but not least, uh, I think explainability is something that really matters. Um, we should all strive for um, AI systems. Um, and they can actually, explainability can actually serve as an important inductive bias for us to design our systems to be more efficient um, and data efficient. So with that, um, I'd like to take any questions at this point. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
होती है Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, some of our colleagues in UW actually have tried that approach on the Hapa Kilo setting, aside from Trump Kowiki setting. Um, but the downside there is kind of you have to know how to decompose the question to gather uh, additional supervision. That's the question, and you have to know how to bring these two subqueries together on the question. Um, no, very good talk. Thank you. Um, now there are some systems that are more of what I would call dialogue question answer. Very simple case working. Of course, it can be much more. How would you characterize the differences between them? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, you can solve yours. I think they're definitely deeply related. So I would oh, talk about uh, one of the examples I talked about during the talk was um, how many people can this room hold? That's a, a very common thing about conversations. And one of the challenges there is actually figuring out what the co-reference is, right? <clears throat> um, you could think of it as, as either a, a co-reference resolution in conversations problem or uh, one can also think about uncontextualizing that thing. <clears throat> so I think that's where they're related. But on the other hand, I think uh, conversational systems uh, tend to more focus on the closed context that's in the conversation itself, mm -hmm. uh, where we are sort of working with other team and how do you parse this. philosophical question. One thing is the bird performed well on this data set. Do you think bird has the ability to or maybe just pick up some more easier case? Uh, the second question is um, how do you think this compares to the multiple multi-hop reasoning you take the quality and you maybe uh, Establish some knowledge graph mm -hmm. so so that you can easily <coughs> do multi hop on that specific query. Think about that. Have you thought about that? Right. Um, I, I can can I answer your second question first because <laughs> I actually worked on uh, knowledge bases uh, for a bit earlier in my PhD. Um, I think knowledge bases are a very efficient way of making use of knowledge uh, if you have a schema. So if you have an entire closed world schema that you know in your head, then that's great. That's a lot more efficient than any question I just asked. You just distill the information into tuples and you go sift it from however many paths of reasoning in the knowledge base very efficiently. But the, the schema is never going to be perfect. There's a huge cost of to pay if you want to scale up a re relation extraction system to arbitrary schema for arbitrary relations because there's always going to be this long tail problem. And knowledge bases are always incomplete, um, not in the, just in the schema sense, but also in the sense that they don't contain all of the knowledge or information. So I think this is also one place where question answering systems can come in and complement knowledge base. As for your first question, whether BERT is capable of doing multiple reasoning in some sense, um, I think we'll have to wait and see. We do see uh, some studies on the constructor setting of the, the data set that this data set in that setting actually contains some which gets some reasonable performance. And so there's always sort of unexpected uh, statistical uh, biases that we knowingly or unknowingly distill into, uh, put into data sets. Um, so I think it's going to be a challenge to figure out what is actually understanding or what is actually reasoning. 
and uh, what are models to work on. I think that's a very good question, and that might relate back to uh, Ellen's previous question about decomposing the question. I think yes, in the sense that the steps we're finding in this this approach, uh, a lot of the times coincide with what your standard parts might say with decomposing the question. And we're tr we're trying to just provide another approach to the same problem where we don't need that kind of you know uh, the logical form of supervision. learning from being a patient.